Okay, so the, the, the second key movement of revelation that I've selected for these lectures is like the first one, a revelation made by God to Moses. And like the first one, it's recounted in the book of Exodus. I guess it's less well known, however, than the story of the burning bush, which is a pity because it is really just as important. To the question, who is God? The revelation at the burning bush answered by giving God's name. And along with the name came an indication both of God's freedom and of his commitment to Israel. The phrase, I will be who I will be, asserted God's sovereign freedom. The revelation of the name does not give anyone control of God, but at the same time, the revelation of the name is his commitment to be the God of his people Israel, who will lead them out of Egypt and make them his chosen people. The name creates a relationship in which Israel can call on God by name. But the question, who is God, might well expect also a different sort of answer, an answer more precisely to the question, what is God like? What sort of God is he? How does he characteristically behave? And the moment of revelation we'll consider this evening answers those kinds of questions about God. It provides actually the fullest description of God's character that the Bible gives us. It probably tells us more about God than anything else in the Old Testament. After the revelation at the burning bush, the book of Exodus, of course, goes on to recount the events of the Exodus from Egypt. And the Israelites then arrive at Mount Sinai, where God makes the covenant with Israel. Moses goes alone up the mountain to receive the law from God, written on tablets by God's own finger. But then the narrative takes a very shocking turn. The Israelites persuade Aaron to make a golden calf and proclaim it their gods who brought them out of Egypt. Only days have elapsed since they pledged themselves to be the Lord's people, and already they are repudiating him, and Moses too, and worshipping other gods. Evidently, they don't want a mysterious, holy, frightening God, a God hidden by the clouds at the top of a mountain that they are not allowed to approach, a God who speaks in thunder and lightning. They want a God they can get hold of and control, a God actually made for them, a God they can carry around with them. Well, God's initial response is what we might expect from the fearsome, thundering God of Sinai. God says to Moses, now let me alone so that my wrath may burn, but not, uh, sorry, may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you, I will make a great nation. God proposes to destroy his people and instead to make Moses and Moses' descendants his covenant people. And there follows a remarkable conversation between Moses and God. It's a conversation in which the very existence of Israel, together with the whole of the rest of their history, hangs in the balance. Will God destroy them in his anger, or will he unexpectedly forgive and remain committed to them? We have time now to follow this conversation in detail, but essentially what happens is that Moses persuades God not to destroy the people, to restore the covenant relationship they have broken almost as soon as it began, to remain their God and to go with them on the rest of the journey to the land he has given them. So at the start of their history with God, Israel proves capable of shocking unfaithfulness, but God shows astonishing grace and forgiveness and commitment. Israel's failure is abject, but God's grace proves more than sufficient to take them beyond it. Thank you. It's a pattern that will be repeated at later junctures in Israel's history. 
it may be that we Christian readers of Exodus take rather for granted God's willingness to forgive. We read the story with hindsight. We know of God's abundant mercy from the rest of the biblical story. But Moses didn't. When Moses tried to persuade God not to destroy the people, he could appeal to God's promises to the patriarchs and ask God to keep his word. But Moses couldn't say, I know that you are merciful and forgiving. He didn't know that. So when improbably, it must have seemed to Moses, God does relent and forgive the people and pledges still to accompany them to the promised land. Moses finds himself wanting to know more about this God who acts in such an extraordinary way. He asks to see who God is. Moses said, show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face but no, no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I shall take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Notice, that God's answer to Moses' request is in three stages, just like his answer to Moses' question about God's name in Exodus 3. The three stages are marked by he said, he said, and the Lord continued. And if you were here last night, you remember that in Exodus 3, it was only at stage 3 that God actually answered Moses' question and revealed his name. In Exodus 3, the first stage was rather off-putting, as though God were refusing Moses' request to know his name. But that first stage proved to be a necessary preliminary protecting God's freedom and transcendence, so that the giving of God's name might not be misunderstood. Now, similarly, in our passage now, it's only at the third stage that God actually promises Moses a glimpse of his divine glory. Not actually granting Moses' request in the way Moses doubtless intended. Not a real vision of God's glory. But at least for this privileged servant of God, a privileged glimpse. In Exodus 3, it was the first stage of God's answer that initially looked like a flat refusal by God to grant Moses' request. Here it's the second stage that looks like a flat refusal. You cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. The first stage in this story, first stage of God's response, actually echoes the words of God in Exodus 3, and therefore creates a link between this key moment of Revelation and the key moment in Exodus 3. Well, so much for parallels with Exodus 3. Now look, let, let, let's look carefully at our passage itself. Moses asks to see God's glory. In the Hebrew Bible, glory means something like visible splendor. It's something that can be seen. But it turns out that what Moses really wants to see is God's face. For the ancient Israelites, it's the face that reveals a person. The human face is amazingly expressive. You know who someone is when you look into their face. To see God's face would be to see who God is, to penetrate the mystery of the God who characteristically hides himself in a cloud. But in God's case, 
his face is glorious, radiates the dazzling brightness of the divine being. And as the Hebrew Bible tells us a number of times, humans cannot see God and remain alive. The experience would be too overwhelming, at least in this life. God's face shines on us, but we may not look into it. Yet God does not simply refuse Moses' request. Moses may not see who God is, but he may hear who God is. God speaks once again his name, which Moses first heard of the burning bush, and he attaches to the name a statement that is also reminiscent of the revelation at the bush. There, you'll remember, before giving them name, God prepared for, it, prepared for doing so by saying, I will be who I will be. God is the one who freely determines who he will be, for he is not the God of Israel because he, as it were, finds himself that. He chooses freely to be Israel's God and commits himself to Israel. That was Exodus 3. Now, he says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. The grammatical construction, quite unusual construction, is the same in Exodus 3 and in Exodus 33. And the point is similar. Merciful and gracious as he is, God remains self-determining. His, mer his mercy can't be controlled and manipulated. If he is being extraordinarily gracious to Israel, it is in his freedom that he chooses to do so. Among other things, this means that Moses can take no credit for having persuaded God. In a sense, he has persuaded God, but not because he has some kind of leverage with God. If God opts to show mercy, it's because he freely chooses. Well, Moses is promised in this conversation a revelatory encounter with God, something more than hearing God's voice out of the cloud as he had on Mount Sinai, God will make all his goodness. Apparently, that's another way of speaking of his glory. He will make all his goodness pass by Moses. But Moses will only be able to glimpse God's glory as it disappears from view. It's a highly anthropomorphic account. The writer has no problem speaking about God's face and God's hand and God's back. But the anthropomorphic language evokes something very mysterious, as the presence of God must be. And like the burning bush, this theophany, this appearance of God, is utterly unique. There's nothing like this in the rest of Scripture. Well, the encounter that God has promised takes place the next time that Moses ascends the mountain. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name, the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. Notice the remarkable emphasis on the divine name at the beginning of the passage. It may be that those five occurrences of the name correspond to the five adjectives in the description. Merciful, gracious, slow to anger, 
steadfast love and faithfulness. But notice particularly the, repeti the repetition when the Lord himself proclaims his name. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord. That doubling of the name of God occurs nowhere else in the Bible. God, as it were, insists that he is this God, the one known by this name. And it's this God who then describes himself as a God who is merciful and gracious and so on. It's as though God is making himself known in the way we know human persons. We typically first learn someone's name. We learn to identify them as that person, and then we learn what they're like. The heart of God's character description is this part. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, that's the Hebrew word chesed, and faithfulness. This key part of the description is echoed many times in the rest of the Old Testament, usually abbreviated or varied to some extent. We'll look at a few of those echoes soon. Um, but if you want to pursue this, it's very interesting to, to trace the echoes of this character description of God uh, through the rest of the Old Testament. Notice how the five adjectives here are all relational terms. They describe how God relates to people in the context specifically to Israel. And they are, without exception, positive. They portray God as overwhelmingly compassionate and caring, patient and forgiving, reliable in his commitment to his people. In other words, they showed to Moses the ground in God's character for the remarkable way in which God has treated Israel since the episode of the golden calf. God has chosen to have mercy because he is this sort of God. Now the word hezed and I've given you the Hebrew because it's not an easy word to translate and you'll find that the, the, the versions vary quite a lot. The modern English versions tend to have settled on the term steadfast love um, as the standard translation. It seems to refer primarily to loyalty in a covenant or a relationship. God's Kezed continues his loving commitment to his covenant people, even when they abuse that relationship and reject God's ways. Faithfulness, therefore, goes together with steadfast love. God keeps his word. He remains faithful to his people, even when they are faithless. The phrase abounding in, in steadfast love and faithfulness is literally in the Hebrew great in steadfast love and faithfulness, giving special emphasis to these two qualities. The phrase is echoed elsewhere in scripture, and only God is ever said to be great in steadfast love. It's a specially divine quality, quality specially characteristic of the God who's committed himself to his people Israel. The rest of the description picks up the term steadfast love and runs with it. Keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children. Now what can seem rather puzzling here is, first, we have an expansive description of God's steadfast love at work, with a strong emphasis on forgiveness, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But then this appears to be qualified, if not contradicted, by what follows, by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children. And there does seem to be a deliberate parallelism between forgiving iniquity and visiting iniquity, which means punishing it. But how are the two related? Does God forgive some people and punish the iniquity of others? Or does he forgive iniquity but nevertheless impose punishment? We'll see in a moment what some other parts of the Old Testament make of this. 
But I'll just make one point about it now. It seems that God, while overwhelmingly forgiving and while in some sense can be relied on to maintain his steadfast love to his people, retains, as it were, the right to punish. God is, again, guarding his self-determining freedom. Already asserted when he said, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now, I doubt this means that God behaves arbitrarily. Rather, God acts for reasons we cannot always know or understand. There is more to God's ways than we can grasp. We can't calculate God's mercy and his judgment. God abounds in steadfast love and faithfulness, and so we can rely on him to act with his people's good at heart. But the ways in which he does this may be far beyond our grasp. He remains, after all, God. Now, I said there are many echoes of this character description of God elsewhere in the Old Testament, and we shall look at a few of them now. Uh, first, there are two passages from the minor prophets, Joel and Jonah. And these passages are quite close. They represent a particular adaptation of the formula, which first of all abbreviates the first part of the character description, reducing the five adjectives to four, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and this version then adds a phrase that's not in Exodus 34, and relents from punishing. It means that God, having pronounced a judgment, then changes his mind and does not carry out the punishment that he had threatened. This is an addition to the punishment, it's an addition to the description that we find in Exodus 34, but it does actually draw on earlier part of Moses' conversation with the Lord. At the beginning of the conversation, when God has declared his intention of destroying the people, Moses pleads with him to change his mind. Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. And that's what God does, according to verse 14 there. Uh, now, that translation... Uh, the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people, sounds rather different from the phrase in Joel and Jonah, uh, which have relents from punishing, Exodus has changed it, but, but it, actually the Hebrew text is very close in those cases. So I think the, uh, the, um, the description in Joel and Jonah probably does pick up that earlier part of the conversation between Moses and God. So Joel and Jonah both make use of a particular version of God's character description, stressing his mercy and compassion, and suggesting that in his mercy and compassion, and, uh, uh, he may revoke a punishment he has threatened. So now let's turn to the context of those passages. In Joel, the prophet has spoken at length about God's judgment impending on people, but now in this passage, he urges them to repent and envisages that if the people, God, that if the people do repent, God may change his mind and not carry out the judgment. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. So God's known character is here a basis for calling Israel to heartfelt, genuine repentance. It's not taken for granted that God will repent. The prophet leaves it as a question. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent? So again, we have the sense that God um, God, God cannot be controlled 
or manipulated by human actions. God remains free, but nevertheless his self-declared character provides ground for hope. And repentance clearly plays a key part in God's decision to revoke the judgment he has announced. Now, we've seen the same version of the character description appears in Jonah. But before we look more closely at Jonah, consider this passage from another of the, May, of the, of the minor prophets. This is from Nahum. Nahum's prophecy is one long oracle of judgment against the Assyrians and their great capital city of Nineveh. And it begins with this appropriate description of God. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and rages against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger but great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. The last two lines echo the character description in Exodus 34. I've put in italics the words taken from Exodus 34. Slow in anger comes from the first, the positive part of the description, but then instead of great in steadfast love, Nahum has great in power, and then continues with words from the second part of the description, the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. Among the various echoes of the Exodus 34 description in the Old Testament, this one is actually unique in applying the description negatively. In other words, as the basis for expecting judgment. God is slow to anger. Nineveh's judgment has not come yet because God is not impetuous, but his punishment of the wicked is assured. This use of the description is also very unusual in applying the description not to God's relationship with his covenant people Israel, but to another nation, Israel's enemy. It's unusual in this respect, but not unique, because Jonah does the same, and in fact, with the same foreign nation in view, Assyria. Jonah, you will remember probably, was ordered by God to go to Nineveh and prophesy God's imminent judgment on the city. Jonah doesn't want to do so, and he sets off to get as far from Nineveh as he possibly can, but he can't escape his vocation. By means of the storm at sea and the big fish, God ensures that he does get to Nineveh, where he spends three days telling the Ninevites that the city will be overthrown in 40 days' time. The Ninevites are convicted by this message. They repent, and God changes his mind and revokes the judgment. But Jonah is not at all pleased. His problem all along has been that he wanted God to destroy Nineveh. He didn't want the Ninevites to hear about their coming judgment in case they might then repent and escape God's judgment. So, this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And God has to then teach Jonah compassion. In terms of how the character description of God is used here, the very remarkable features are, I think, first, that it's applied to God's relationship with a non-Jewish nation, as in Nahum, but only as in Nahum. And it's applied positively, as it is not in Nahum. God deals with a foreign nation, even a great enemy of Israel, as Nineveh was, 
in just the same way as he deals with his covenant people. The character description of God, which originally referred strictly to God's dealings with his covenant people, has now broken out of those limits. His steadfast love no longer refers only to his covenant loyalty to his own people, but also to God's consistent concern for the good of other people too. It characterizes not only who God is for Israel, but simply who God is. We can see this also in one other, I think, really remarkable text in the Old Testament from Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all that he has made. I've put the Hebrew words there so you can see how merciful in the first, in verse 8, uh, and compassion in verse 9 are from the same Hebrew root. Merciful is in the character description in Exodus. Uh, compassion is not, but you can see how it's fundamentally the same word. Um, what the psalmist does then is, first of all, in verse 8, he quotes the traditional character description, stopping short at steadfast love, just as Joel and Jonah also do. That's a standard abbreviation of the character description. Then he makes his own interpretation of the traditional character description in verse 9. He explicitly universalizes it extends its refer reference beyond Israel to all people and indeed to all creatures, all that God has made. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all that he's made. And if you read the rest of the psalm, you'll see that it's very clear the psalmist does have in mind not only humans, but all other creatures too. God cares for his whole creation with the same steadfast love characterizes his relationship to Israel. Well, please do read through that whole psalm sometime. It's a, the whole psalm is a kind of reflection on God's universal kingdom. The central verses of the psalm celebrate God's kingdom, God's rule, the kingdom in which he rules over all and manifests his character, his grace, his mercy, his patience, his steadfast love, his faithfulness, most emphatically to all his works, all he has created. So that the very last verse of the psalm says, all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. So we have seen how within the Old Testament, the revelation of the character of God given to Moses on Sinai is taken as normative, but it is also interpreted and developed further insights into its meaning are gained as the prophets and the psalmists reflect on it. Most importantly, whereas in Exodus 34 only God's relationship with his covenant people is in view, in other texts the context broadens to all the nations and even all creation. Remember that the key terms in that description of God are relational. They refer to how God deals with people. He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, all in relation to people. And what becomes clear in the passages we've considered is that these descriptions are regarded as normative for God's dealings not only with the covenant people to whom he promised his loyalty, his special care, his mercy, but also with all the other nations who are not or not yet his peoples. Nevertheless, God's character is consistent. The Old Testament writers, for all their focus on God's chosen people, see that if this is how God is, it must be how he is in his dealings with all people and all creation. 
Well, so important is this character description of God in the Old Testament, it would be surprising if the writers of the New Testament ignored it. If this is what God is like, he must be like that in his self-revelation and salvific action in Jesus, one would expect. Yes, and the most important place in the New Testament in which Exodus 34, the Exodus 34 character description of God is taken up is in the prologue to John's Gospel. This is a very significant context because the Johannine prologue is devoted really to showing readers of the gospel how, starting from the Old Testament, they are to understand the story of Jesus that follows in the rest of the gospel. And the key passage for us is this end part of the prologue. And the word became flesh and lived among us. We have seen his glory, the glory as of our father's only son, full of grace and truth skipping a bit, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God's only Son who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Notice there, first of all, the references to Moses that take us back to Exodus 33 and 34. The law was given through Moses. Yes, of course. And the law was grace. John is positive about it. God's grace to his people was expressed in the Sinai covenant. So when the incarnation happens and God makes himself known in Jesus, that is grace upon grace. Grace in addition to the grace already given at Sinai. The old covenant was grace, and Jesus Christ is more grace. But with Exodus 34 in mind, when we read to verse 18, no one has ever seen God, we cannot but recall that Moses was not allowed to see God. Not, that is, to see God's face. And when John says that no one has ever seen God, He's not, I think, denying those visions of God that were granted to a number of privileged individuals in the Old Testament, but he means they did not see God's face. And that's the crucial point, because as we noticed in discussing Exodus, it's in the face that one really sees who someone is. So no one has ever seen who God is. Glimpses of glory, like that given to Mo Moses, there have been. But not the insight into what God is like that only his face could give. Moses heard what God is like, but could not see it. Even in that moment of revelation, God remained hidden, covering Moses' eyes to keep him from seeing. Contrast, verse 14 of John's prologue, the word became flesh and we have seen his glory. That we is the we of the eyewitnesses, the disciples of Jesus who actually saw Jesus in his physical visibility and were gifted with spiritual insight to see the divine glory in that physical person and life of Jesus. Because Jesus is the only son of his father, the glory they saw in him was the reflected glory of his father. Glory as of the only one from the father, full of grace and truth. There's the Exodus 34 character description, though you might not recognize it immediately. Here's the Exodus passage and the key phrase from John. Like many of the Old Testament references to the divine character description, John has summed up the five adjectives by selecting just two of them. But he's imitated the structure of the last part of the description. 
abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. In his phrase, full of grace and truth. The Hebrew word for faithfulness, emet, is often in the Greek Bible translated as aletheia, truth. Faithfulness is being true to your word. Faithfulness is truth as a personal characteristic. For Hezed, steadfast love, John seems to, to use the Greek word charis, grace, which is an unusual, in, uh, an unusual translation of Hezed, but not impossible. I think John may have chosen it not simply to translate Hezed, but to summarize all four of the first four adjectives, merciful, gracious, slow to anger, steadfast love. Grace is God's generosity to his people, and that's what all those adjectives amount to. So John is saying that Jesus manifested in his person and life the character of God, full of grace and truth. What Moses had heard, but not been allowed to see, Jesus made visible. We have, uh, we have seen his glory. Then see how John compares and contrasts the revelation through Moses and in Jesus. Um, yeah. uh, from his fullness we have all received. This is verse 16. From his fullness we have all received. He says all because now he's talking about Christians in general. The previous we was the eyewitnesses. We all are Christian believers. We have all received from his fullness grace upon grace. That's grace in Christ in addition to the grace of the law. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came. The Greek word is geneto, through Jesus Christ. And that verb geneto here really means something like came about, happened. The divine character, steadfast love and faithfulness, grace and truth, happened in Jesus. Jesus' whole being and life and death were the steadfast love and faithfulness of God in action. Goes on, no one has ever seen God. It is the only one, himself God, who is in the bosom of the Father, who has made him known. No human, not even Moses, has seen who God is in the holy splendor of his face. But the only one, because he is uniquely close to the Father, because he gazes into the face that expresses the infinite goodness of God, he alone has described him, exegesito. In the 3rd century BC, the Jewish sage Ben Sira summoned his readers to glorify the Lord with all their powers because they could never match his inexpressible greatness. Who has seen him and can describe him, he asks. Who has seen him and can describe him? It's a rhetorical question. He expects people to say no one has seen God and can describe God. But John, in effect, answers the question. Um, only the utterly unique one has seen him and so can describe him. That description is the life and death of Jesus. More than once the gospel says, that whoever has seen Jesus has seen the Father. The extraordinary message of John's Gospel is that only human flesh in its visibility could make that true. So the character description of God revealed to Moses, heard though not seen by Moses, is described visibly, made visible in the flesh of Jesus, his character and his life and death, full of grace and truth. In the rest of John's Gospel, truth is a divine attribute which is often ascribed to Jesus. For example, he is the way, the truth, and the life. But the other word, charis, grace, 
is never used in the gospel after the prologue. In the space of three verses of the prologue, John uses that word four times. Grace and truth, grace upon grace, grace and truth. But never again. If grace in the prologue sums up those first four adjectives in the divine description, merciful, gracious, so to anger and of steadfast love, and if that verbal description was made visible in Jesus, it seems very strange that John then drops the word grace and never uses it again in the rest of the gospel. Well, I think the answer to that, the reason for that, is that love, agape, takes over as John's summary of what God is like. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the merciful, generous character of God in action in the events of the gospel. Actually, John does not use the noun agape, love, very often. But as in that famous sentence, he uses the verb to love and uses it very frequently. His gospel is about God's love happening and carries grace, the, word, the Greek word charis, would not have supplied him with a corresponding verb to describe all that happening of grace and truth, all that divine love occurring in the story of Jesus. So part of the reason, I think, why grace no longer seems appropriate for John's use, why he substitutes love, is that with the word love, he's got both a noun and a verb. The word grace, he hasn't. But I think there's also another reason why John, as it were, translated grace in the prologue into love in the rest of the gospel. The incarnation not only revealed God's character in visible form, the concrete person and life and death of the man Jesus, it also revealed the loving relationship between the Father and the Son, the love of the Father for the only Son who is in his bosom and the son's love for his father. In other words, the incarnation reveals not only, as in Exodus 34, what God is like in his relationship with the world, but also what God is like in his inner being. The eternal love between the father and the son is the source from which the love of God overflows into the world in the incarnation of the Son and his death for the life of the world. God is love in himself as well as in relation to his creation. And he is love in relation to his creation because he is antecedently love in himself. Thank you.